uh, I'd like to introduce Mark Donner, one of our engineering directors here. Enjoy. Um, thank you very much. Um, welcome also. Uh, I'm Bud's warm up act. Um, so uh, uh, welcome to Google. Um, I'm going to take a couple minutes and tell you a little bit about the New York office and uh, some of the opportunities we offer here. If I can make it change slides. OK. Uh, this is an interesting building. It's the second largest office building in Manhattan. Uh, it's uh, about 2.9 million square feet. It was originally built as a warehouse by the Port Authority um, early in the last century. Uh, was derelict for a long time, was bought by some developers who uh, rehabilitated it. Um, and uh, uh, it's also actually one of the major peering points for the internet uh, for the uh, Northeast. So uh, your packets have probably been here before. Um, there are four large freight elevators, each of them big enough to hold an 18-wheeler, and I've seen it done, uh, that go all the way from from uh, ground floor to uh, to the 16th floor, uh, though actually two of them have been disabled. One of them was turned into a set of fire stairs. The other one uh, is somehow closed off. Um, so there are about 3,000 uh, Google employees here, uh, about half of them engineers and uh, half of them salespeople and business people of various sorts. Um, so we're big. We're the largest uh, engineering center outside of Mountain View for Google. Um, we, uh, as you can see and you've heard before, we focus on quality of life um, <clears throat> and food. As you can tell, I, uh, I definitely partake. Um, this this is uh, actually one of our cafes during the daytime. Um, and we do silly things and have fun. We have some uh, fairly well-known people. Um, and uh, let's see. Yes, we have various famous people visit here because we're we're fun. Um, and we are in fact hiring. Let me tell you um, a little bit about today. Uh, we'll have the talk uh, at uh, at six thirty-five and uh, a little Q and A uh, after that. Um, I'm not going to read Bud's abstract. I'm sure you you saw it posted on the uh, on the, the Meetup website. I've known Bud since we were grad students together um, many, many years ago, um, at least five. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you. Pick up your nickel afterwards. Um, Bud, Bud is a professor at uh, Courant Institute uh, at NYU. Um, and uh, we, we, he and I both started out originally as electrical engineers, hardware people uh, with some math background. We became computer scientists. Uh, Bud went on into biology and uh, has done some remarkable and uh, entertaining things here uh, uh, since then. Um, he also has the distinction of, of naming his two children, uh, Tom and Sam, in such a way that their their initials are also their short names. But can you hear me? I also have a daughter, Kimberly Indira Mishra, Kim. So since it's being videotaped, I don't want it to be that bad. So um, I'm going to go to my talk. There you go. So um, I'm going to tell you a few of the things that I had been thinking about for the last 12 years. It's mostly in biology. Um, and um, sort of walked into biology totally accidentally. But I seem to have gotten trapped. Uh, sort of my Napoleon and Russia. I've gotten in but can't get out. And um, I want to say a few things about why it has remained so interesting. Um, so. Those of you who can recognize him, great. But those of you who don't know him, his name is William Stanley Jevons. He's one of the earliest computer scientists that I know. He actually built this computer. Um, so this is a uh, machine that he called the Logic Piano. 
And the idea was to take logical formulas involving variables A, B, C, and D, so four variables, uh, and negations, and also has an OR operation, which he called a conjunction. I think the idea that OR should be called a disjunction is a more recent logical invention. And of course, being a good Englishman, he also has good punctuation. He had a full stop, a period. Um, he's actually better known as the economist who invented the marginal theory of utility. Um, but for us, Hilderman, a computer scientist, a statistician, a logician, and an economist, he also um, is remembered for a paradox that's known as Jevons paradox. And uh, first appeared in his book, The Coal Question, in 1865. This is when he was about 29. By 25, he had already written his marginal theory of utility. Um, after James Watt introduced his more efficient coal-fired um, steam engine, somewhat counterintuitively, England's consumption of coal skyrocketed, notwithstanding the higher efficiency. So this was very surprising, and he gave an explanation for this. And this paradoxical effect has been called a backfire or a rebound. So, so this is sort of the picture that uh, New Yorker had to describe this efficiency dilemma. So more efficient we make things, the harder it gets to achieve the goals. And this idea of rebound comes up in many places. One place is um, not so much in computer science, but in genomics and biological sciences, and which has followed their own version of Moore's law. So this is Gordon Moore, and of course, all of us know about Moore's law. And um, in, uh, I think, 1965 or so, he looked at number of components for integrated functions and plotted them on a log-log plot, log uh, over time plot, and uh, came to the conclusion that the number of components will keep doubling every 18 months or so. And interestingly enough, that trend has remained. Um, similarly, we have also talked about a Moore's law in biotechnology. So if you look at the curve, um, so one is the cost per megabase of DNA sequences. The cost has kept going down. But interestingly enough, around October of 2007, it seems to have taken over a much faster Moore's law. So unlike computer science as Moore's law, we have a doubling effect every five months. Okay. So that also reflects in the cost for a whole genome. So not surprisingly, we hear about being able to sequence our genome for about $1,000 in not so distant future. So what does that going to look like? So even if we look at what's available now, we can project it forward. And of course, there are lots of talks about what's going to happen in a few years. Uh, about six months ago, you could get 200 gigabase pairs in about eight days on one of these Illumina Isaac machines. So that means that I can actually sequence your genome 50 times over in about eight days. Of course, eight days is still a big problem because if you can get it down to few a few days, like five days or four days, one would be able to accomplish the X prize. We haven't done the X prize yet. So there is an X prize in genomics, which requires you to sequence 100 people in 10 days, costing no more than about $10,000 per person. So we are inching towards that. But yet, we haven't yet produced error-free haplotypic genome assembly algorithm. Okay. So to get you oriented, your genome is about 3 billion base pairs if you are not counting the haplotypes. That means you actually have two copies of all your autosomes and an X, X chromosome and a Y chromosome, two sex chromosomes. Currently, if I look at the to um, the pair of autosomes, so chromosome 1 through 22, 
then um, sorry 21 then um, those two copies are very similar to each other the current method is not able to distinguish them so the sequences we have generated the whole genome sequence we have is a genotypic sequence so one of the questions is how hard is it to get to haplotypic sequences so to be able to tell your father from your mother okay we can't do that now well there are some arguments that if we spend a lot of money with a lot of work we could do it but um, there are algorithmic reasons and other technological reasons why it has been very difficult. The other side of the question is, do we need it? Maybe genotypic sequences are good enough. So we want to look at that. And the other, que the, the related question is, if this Moore's law keeps going forward at this rate, will it be possible to do haplotypic sequence assembly? So um, here is the sort of the picture we have some sort of reference sequence so you can think of Craig Venter Jim Watson or Bishop Tutu or Bishop Tutu's son we have few such reference genomes for a few humans what we would like to do is to read your genome and somehow align them to this genome so that we have location information and look at some base pair that differs in the population so these will be the single nucleotide polymorphism and if we know certain traits for the people that are closely associated with these polymorphisms, then we could say that these are associated with certain disease or traits and look for nearby genes that hitchhike with them, that co segregate with them. So that way, we could look for genes or markers that could explain various diseases. Right. Unfortunately, we haven't been very successful at doing that. So there was an article in Scientific American with the title Revolution Postpone, which is great because if you're a genomicist, you can go on vacation until the revolution restarts. But the question has been also why we have this situation. So we can produce large amount of genomic data very cheaply, and the cost is going down, but yet we are not able to understand or explain this data. So in fact, we can actually create a lot of this kind of information, short reads, about 100 base pairs, that could be aligned to the reference sequences we have, but yet that's not good enough to explain why we haven't been able to use that data to explain complex diseases. So there have been lots of different explanations for that. But my explanation is that we have to worry about things that we don't have in the genomes, things that we can't see in the genome. So these are the genomic dark matter, dark matter. Most of the reference sequences are genotypic, as I explained. We somehow combine the genome that we get from your father and the mother into some consensus sequence that may not be anything related to either the father or the mother. And we also lack long range information. So your genome could be actually rearranged. The pieces of genomes that could have moved, they could be duplicated, there could be inversions, and there could be translocations. So one piece has moved from one individual to another. We can't see them in this picture. Okay. Um, about if I read your genome, I can't actually place about 30% of the reads anywhere in the genome. I don't know where to place them given that I have only four reference sequences, okay? If you do some tech, use a different technology where you can read very long pieces but with low resolution, so you find some physical markers, um, one such technology is, a, is an optical mapping technology that I have been involved with, then you can see that there are lots of structural variants, a lot of rearrangements that could not be inferred from the known reference sequences or the short reads we get. Right. And when we do genome-wide association studies, um, based on the genomic data that we can get, it has been inadequate in explaining common diseases. Okay. 
So that's my Javan's, Javanian backfire for genomics. We can continue to produce more and more data. Short reads, the, lengths have, the length of these reads have become shorter. They have had more errors, but we have increased the throughput and reduced the cost. And we've done this better than anything in computer science. But yet, we have all this data that we have to move from the sequencing machine through some data processing into a cloud and do all the things we can do, but come up with nothing. Is this clear? Yeah. OK. And sorry, we, data. we're drowning in data deluge. So, okay, so that's the problem that I'm going to get your attention on. So down here, you have sequencers. The classical sequencing technology was due to Sanger. But there are many more new ideas that have come up. So there's a technique based on pyrosequencing. And the cheapest one is based on a simple pH meter. Because as I incorporate each base, I'll throw out some um, protons, some ions. And if I measure that, and by associating with the cycles and this change in the pH, I can actually tell which base I'm reading. And I can do that in massive amount. In fact, I can do it on a transistor and can build a digital device where each transistor will tell me what base I'm reading. So I can take the classical computer science hardware technology, marry that with genomics technology, and can get this biotechnology Moore's law. So I can create massive amount of data. Once I have that, so these are going to be analog data, because all I'm doing is measuring pH. Or if I'm doing pyrosequencing, I'm measuring some um, photonic data. That's analog data. So imagine that there are data coming out in four channels, one for A, one for T, one for C, and one for G. And this analog data has to be converted into a digital signal. So I have to call them into A, T, C, G. And that's what the base calling will do. And once I have done this base calling, I'm going to take them over a network and into a cloud. And I'm going to find the position where it came from. And once I align them, I should be able to see small mutations. Maybe one base has changed, single, single nucleotide mutation. Or maybe there's a short insertion or deletion. And once I have that, I'll be able to tell what kind of mutations you have, what kind of polymorphisms you have. And then from that, I could be able to predict your trait, <coughs> to personalize medicine, um, find um, the population you belong to, population stratification, so on and so forth. Okay. And that's called resequencing. But often, I may take those short sequence reads and combine them to piece together your genome. And I would like to do that haplotypically. So, and there's a lot of stuff I can do. Many of them are interesting algorithmic questions or machine learning questions that will happen in high-level sequence analysis. But right now, we have improved the technology here. We can generate a huge amount of data. And in fact, after I base call, I probably will put in a hard drive and FedEx it to the cloud. That's probably the technology we'll be using for a while. Okay. So we are finding it difficult to cross this boundary. Is that going to get better? So I have to store this data. I have to move it over a network. Well, the trouble is that the storage disk density is, doub is doubling annually, and that trend is going to continue. I'm going to double this data, the genomic data, every five months. And, and this problem is going to get worse for me every five months. Okay. Unless somebody comes up with a better network or better storage system. Okay. So that's the first issue. So here is a simple solution. So we have sequencing machine. We have base calling. So we get 100 base reads of ATCGs. 
There were a massive amount of them, and we are moving it to the cloud where it will get aligned. What happens if I take the reference or whatever um, analysis system I have and move that analysis to the sequence emission? In particular, I'm going to take my Bayesian models and the Bayesian priors, put it directly into the sequence emission. So the idea would be, as I base call, after I've read the first I basis, when I go to the I plus first base, if I know where that first I basis go, then I have a prior about what the next base is likely to be. Because you don't differ very much from Craig Venter in most of the places. Okay. And here I have an analog signal. If I combine that, I can improve my base calling. Moreover, since I have an alignment, only thing I have to send is the only differences. In fact, I may not even send those. If I found a mutation in BRCA1, I can call it and say that you have this much risk in breast cancer. So in fact, what I have to send is very little. So most of the analysis, instead of putting the analysis in the cloud, I want to move the entire analysis, all the priors, to the sequencing mission. Does that make sense? Yeah. I could, um, instead of keeping just one reference sequence, I could keep about 10,000 haplotypically sampled sequences there. I could tell which population you come from. And within that population, what mutations you have and how likely that mutation is going to be. I can also tell if you have a de novo mutation. That means you have a mutation that's not ever seen in a human population. De novo mutations have gotten a lot of in, uh, interest right now because we think, first of all, we think there are unusually large number of de novo mutations in humans compared to other primates. And also, sorry? Um, that's true, but the arguments have been that, uh, so one of the arguments, there are, in biology there are many theories, so one of the arguments has been that um, humans have a lot of P73 mutations. So P73 is a gene that um, does um, embryonic surveillance. So that means when you are conceived, um, there is a system that checks, so, okay, if you're not, the embryonic lethality process will eliminate you fairly quickly. What people notice that there is a gene called MDM2 that seem to have a mutation and has been positively selected. MDM2, unfortunately, causes cancer. So why would a cancer-causing mutation be positively selected? Because of um, MDM2 controls P53. P53 does um, somatic surveillance. That means it actually watches your cells in your body. And if there are errors, P53 initiates an apoptosis. So by reducing the effect of P53, you have actually um, gotten rid of an effective somatic surveillance. But the same thing can also reduce embryonic surveillance and give you higher fertility. So you could trade off cancer for higher fertility. So it's possible that we did that trade off, and we are tolerating more mutations than other species. So that seems to be a plausible explanation. But we do know that we have more de novo mutations. P53 is a tumor suppressor. Uh, his question is uh, P53, P63, P73, are these dominant or recessive? Right, it's a tumor suppressor gene, P53. So what that means is you have to knock out both. You need two hits to stop it. So P73 is similar. So as long as you have one intact, you are fine. So anyway, there's a uh, digression. But the idea is to move all that analysis directly to the sequence emission. 
So your sequencing machine is no longer going to produce ACTGs, but just the location of the mutations and some sort of confidence of how much, the, how likely that the mutation is correct. So um, how would we do such a thing? So remember, I'm looking at a bunch of analog signals coming out of sequencing machine. So yeah, I have, say, a series of n such web uh, bits or bases that are coming out. And what I would like to do is to translate it into a sequence of ATCG. In fact, I'm going to extend that alphabet to ATCG plus an insertion or a deletion. So it's a six-letter alphabet. So I have six to the power n possible matches. And I'm suggesting that we look at all six to the power n. So the way I will do is in initially, I could hypothesize that the first base is A, T, C, or G. And the second one is similarly for each one A, T, C, G. So I have a huge tree. And each one will be scored by some sort of scoring function. So it will be some sort of likelihood that given the signal I see, and given the alignments I have, what is the likelihood that particular base is correct, a particular path in this tree is correct. So I'm going to try to fish out that one path out of this exponentially many possible ones. Right? So in the beginning, in the early stage, if my error rates are low, I'll more or less rely on the analog signal. But as I go forward, since my sequences will have very few alignments, the underlying genome, the underlying prior, will get more weight. Okay. So that's all I need to do. So I'm going to do a branch and bound, something like a beam search, and keep expanding this tree and pruning it. The advantage, the interesting objective is that given certain error rates and given how the structures of the genomes vary, most likely finding, the, finding this path will be relatively easy. Most of the times, with probability, with very high probability, my branching factor will be something like 1 plus epsilon, or a very small epsilon. So, so that's what I'm going to do. So the first thing is to turn it into a Bayesian formula. So given the analog signal x sub k on the kth cycle, I want to find the probability that the underlying base is B. And I write down the base formula. And what I have is the conditional probability that given B, what is the probability that I'll see the intensity X of K? It depends on the underlying technology. And from the genome, I know what is the conditional probability that the K base is actually B. And also, I can similarly calculate the conditional probabilities if it is not the base B but the other one. So if I'm looking for A, not B is T, C, or G. Okay. And if I turn that into a log likelihood and do some simplification, so I've got one term that corresponds with intensities that I get from the sequencing machine and the other term that looks for the alignment. So what I have to do is to calculate these alignments very, very fast. Right. So as I read each base, I have to calculate all possible alignments. And that will tell me what the next base is likely to be. So I need to count the next base very accurate. The first part is easy. Um, yes? So I have a base and, right, I have a base and bias. Okay. Right. So, um, so what I have to do is to be very careful in how I introduce the bias. So what I'm going to do is to have a weighting term, and I'm going to weigh it in terms of what errors I'm going to get in the technology in each cycle. And of course, I'm going to read the same genome more than once. So, so I'll get certain confidence, and I have to combine them in the sequencing machine to improve the data. So if I... Right, right. So if I have more references, I can reduce that bias. But you also have self-references here. You're sequencing the same thing, but it's not. Right, that's, right. That's a better 
Right, right, right. But we'll do the same thing. I'll show you examples of that in de novo mutation. So de novo assembly. So the first thing we do is um, do a linear transformation to um, get rid of certain uh, cycle by cycle errors. So there are some systematic errors. Also, there are cross dots. So each channel, A, T, C, G, will affect each other. So um, we do a linear transformation, and we model the intensity as a the conditional probability of the intensity corresponding to base. And if you do that, the raw data will look like this. And with a linear transformation, you get fairly clean data sets. So for example, for looking for A, my intensities will be distributed like the blue thing at different cycles. And anything that's not A will be red. So up to about 50 or 60 cycles, I can very easily distinguish them. But as I go forward in cycles, they will get noisier and noisier. And the idea is that I will trust my intensities in the beginning. I don't want it to be biased by my base and priors. But as I go forward, I may increase the bias. So we'll create a weighting function that actually adapts to the technology. The second thing is that I want to do the alignment and call the next phase rapidly. And for that, we'll use a suffix tree, but actually compress it using Boros Willard transform. And by just calculating the Ferragina Manzini indices, I could count the next phase very rapidly. Because the, the indices will tell me exactly what the next basis are. And that's all I need to do. Okay. So I got both the information fairly uh, easily. And uh, there's a little bit of work because I have a null model and I have to call a p-value because that's what I'll do to combine the data. Okay. I could do this in batch and combine all the reads I've gotten so far to create a new prior and override the other priors I have. But I think a better approach is to subsample the human genome about 10,000 times, take 10,000 individuals. And human genomes, if you do a capture, recapture analysis, for European population, it seems about 4,000 individuals are sufficient. For the entire humans, it's about 10,000. That means you are fairly close to one of the people. I'm in my 10,000 samples. So you have already a cousin or a second cousin in a fairly small sample. So by using ideas like that, you can speed up these things while controlling the base and bias. So one of the reasons is that um, we humans went through a population bottleneck about 60,000 years ago. Um, so in spite of all the de novo mutations and all the things we talked about, um, there are a lot of similarities at short distances. So there could be a lot of rearrangements and copy number changes. At the short distances, this could help us. So here is the um, sort of a, a comparison between what this algorithm does and the best that's in the market that other people have developed. Not surprisingly, as I increase the base and the, the, the priors coming from the reference, I do better, a lot better. So. In fact, these are different weighting scales. Right. So clearly by weighting more and more towards reference, on most of the bases, I'll do correct. I'll, I'll call them correct. But that's not a good approach because um, of my base and bias. I could be missing your mutation. So one of the things to look for is what is the probability of false positive that I'll call a base and mutation while it's not a mutation. So in fact, this actually helps you. So false positives can be reduced just by weighing it further and further. But if you use your reference with higher weight, that will increase the false negatives. So the sensitivity will drop as you increase the weight. So by, by trading off between the weights and the false positives and false negatives, you can tune it to finding the mutations rapidly and correctly. So the idea is to. What 
so 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 that will depend on the coverage and that will depend on um, the false positives and false negatives I want to tolerate. Right. So for it will depend on the technology. So um, for Illumina missions, it's about 10 or 20x coverage sufficient because you are going to still hit the most of the correct mutations in the first 60 bases. Remember, my false negatives don't drop off until about 60 bases or so. So over that range, I can actually call them quite well. So all the other ones are just adding to that. So I'm not going to call false positives very often, but I'll miss some, but I'll compensate for that through the coverage. So, um, so one way to do this is to um, start sequencing in a clinic, in a clinical application, and start calling up to a confidence level. So some of the mutations will not show up until, say, two hours, three hours. Most of the mutations will show up in about an hour. So the longer you call, then um, the better confidence you have on the mutations. So, so the trick is to tune your confidence level and how quickly you want to call them. Okay. The other interesting thing is that all of this can be implemented in the hardware, in uh, the PGA. And even if you have millions of lens calling simultaneously, you could do this in real time. One of the problems would be that you'll be doing a lot of context switching. So you have to take the states and store them and restore them. So think about it. But that's pretty much the only problem that this hardware will face. Okay, so you need um, locally some sort of way of storing and restoring states rapidly. But the idea is that instead of doing this, the classical technique where a lot of this data is going to go to the cloud and then get called, you want to turn your sequencing machine into a clinical machine. Okay, so that seems like um, you get data compression, you get accuracy, you can stop the data deluge right at the source. But I think this idea is much more general. If you're an astronomer, you could imagine putting a base and priors about your exoplanets right in your synthetic aperture radars. So you don't have to move all the data back and forth. But, right, so they should be able to call directly when they see one. As long as they have a model of the transit times, model of what they're looking for. Same thing in genomics. A lot of the things can be moved directly to the device instead of being in the cloud. Okay. Sorry, what do I? This data reduction. Um, So right now, the scale is not uh, that hard. So we're talking about embedded system. Uh, we believe right now it's not a difficult problem because there are about a million lens. And actually, each cycle is about 30 minutes because they have to wash and do all sorts of things, chemistry. But we believe that all the, both those numbers will scale up. So we expect the cycle time to get down to about five minutes. Physically, right? The question is in terms of do I want to do it in real time or not? So right now we have an implementation with one single application. Okay. But I can speed that up. Right now it's not a problem because the cycle time is half an hour. And I can get real time response in that cycle time. But as that improves. No. No, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this. I'm sorry. Okay. You're talking about hardware which would at the upper bound be something that fit inside of the small You're not talking oh, about right. a data center no. no, 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 no. I'm not talking about that. About right. Something right. Something of that size that goes into a sequencing mission, right. 
Right. It's small. Right. 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 Okay. Okay. So we're not talking about something very cumbersome. Okay. So what would we? What should the future look like? What, in order to get around the problems, um, we would like to have a typical sequence of about ten thousand humans. Okay. So uh, it should be accurate. Um, it will characterize all the polymorphisms, such as SNPs, indels, rearrangements. Um, we want to characterize genomics of human populations. So we want to know all the mutations, duplications, gene conversions. So gene conversion is a process in which one allele can force the other allele to become the same. Uh, recombinations and migration, uh, one of model population bottlenecks that have happened in humans in various subpopulations. Uh, we want to understand the effects of positive selections and gene sweeps, um, and also negative selections and rare variants. We'd like novel algorithms to stochastically model population structures. So um, population structures means that uh, our populations are stratified into many, many subpopulations and mixtures. We'd like to understand that process. Just to give you an idea, it's not, we don't have a pan making human populations, not any two random individuals will mate. In fact, uh, one out of eight males is a direct descendant of Genghis Khan or his grandfather. Um, we don't have a good model of all of these. We'd like to do association studies um, and um, understand origin and progression diseases and go for individualized medicines. And another thing that's sort of very crucial is to phenotype. When somebody says a child is autistic, what does it mean? Can the society of psychologists change the definition of autism? Will that change anything? Um, same kinds of problems on ADD or any of the other phenotypes we talk about. Um, and, and the goal here is to understand causal genes. And that requires us to understand better what we mean by causality. Um, and without that, the, our entire process could be highly flawed. Ultimately, to do this, yes. What do you think is the answer to that question? Which is? I think so. I think you can. Right. I mean, the, and the technology is not that difficult. Um, I think the Moore's law should continue. I'd like to go for a thousand rupees genome, which is about $23 um, for 6 billion haplotypic basis, only over 135 billion US dollars for the entire human population, less than the uh, amount of money you need to bail out Greece. So I think that's worth it. Um, I also like the idea of Freeman Dyson that we should aim for a lap laptop genome sequence. So what he says is I'm proposing now to hijack Moore's prediction and apply it to biology. The sequencing machines that now exist are marvel of ingenuity, but they are cumbersome and expensive. What biology now needs is a single molecule sequencer that can handle one molecule at a time and sequence it by physical rather than chemical. Which is, I find, very interesting. A single molecule machine could be much cheaper as well as faster than existing machines. It might be as small and convenient as a laptop computer. So what we would like to get is a laptop sequencer. Um, so what should the Moore's law look like? Um, it should be miniaturizable, can get smaller. What that means is it should be able to work with one single DNA molecule, one at a time. Could work with single cells. Uh, that's important because if I am uh, working in say cancer, we know that tumors are highly heterogeneous. Each cell is different. So we'd like to be able to take extra DNA from every single cell. It should be nanoscale, so to be able to actually query or work with any single DNA and should work in femtoseconds. Okay, so that's what we, for base, right. So we can't uh, approach that speed yet. We should be able to work with minute amount, uh, amount of materials. What that means is that we should avoid chemically changing your DNA. Often that happens if I do PCR or some sort of cloning. Any amplification can introduce errors. We'd like it to be non-invasive. That means if I query a DNA, I don't destroy it. I should be able to come back and 
do it again. Uh, it should be asynchronous. It doesn't have to be done real time. And another idea I think is important for Moore's law is that it should be abstract. I should be able to abstract them. So in fact, a geneticist should not have to understand the kinds of errors that happen in the chemistry in the sequences. Right now, we do have to worry about it. So um, it should be modular. I would like to also emphasize that it should be mostly computational, then physical, and then chemical. The main reason is that the computational Moore's law is still going to dominate. And I want to hitchhike on the computational Moore's law. In physical sensing, it's relatively easy. I can go from optical systems to atomic force microscopy to Raman scattering and so on and so forth. And I want to keep the chemistry to the end because usually they're hard to speed up. I would like to see error resilience. So we have to think about how to build reliable technology out of unreliable parts. So instead of trying to eliminate errors at the very basic level, we'd like to allow that but still make the technology reliable. And one other interesting question to ask is uh, there are zero one laws in this probabilistic analysis. We could use that to do experiments. That means in my technology, there are parameters that I can so tune that it will generate only easy instances of hard problems. I want to tune the technology so that it does that. So with a high probability, I can create the correct solution. Okay. This is, these are all the things that we have used in computer science and benefited. Biotechnology hasn't really done that. So, um, so here is a technology from optical mapping where there are single molecule, low resolution maps. And these are, each, mo each one is a single molecule, and these are about 300 kilobases. Okay. It can't read single base at a time, but can read certain physical markers on that. And that can be combined to get very high resolution picture of your genome. And that can tell you rearrangements, haplotypes, so on and so forth. But it can't tell you single base mutation. So you want to combine these two to actually get you to haplotype sequencing. So those of you who don't know uh, anything about sequencing, the problem is relatively straightforward to explain. You take a, your DNA and break it into small pieces. So this is called shotgun sequencing. And these short pieces can be read so imagine this short piece to be about 1,000 base pairs. And sometimes I can read that full length. Or it can be a little bit longer, 5 kilo bases, and I'll read a few hundred bases from both ends. So the data I get are some 100 base, 200 base, or 700 base reads. And sometimes they come in pair, and I know the distance between them. OK. That's your data. And what you have to do is to, there's no location information. So when I do this reading, I don't have any information where they come from. Um, all I know are the reads. And what I want to do is to somehow combine them to reconstruct the data. Okay, that's the problem. And um, the way we solve it is by using a greedy algorithm. I take pairs of reads. I overlap them and score them in the amount of overlaps I have between a pair. Greedily, I choose the first most overlapping pair. I combine them, replace those two by the new one, and continue doing that. Okay. Clearly, it's not a good algorithm. It's highly suboptimal, but it's our best idea. Okay. This is what Craig Venter claimed to have done. But actually, they do make pairs. They did use med pairs, so uh, it's not a pure shotgun assembly. Right. So, but but the algorithm, this I, this idea, goes into most of the assembly algorithms. A few other good ideas. So one is to turn this into some sort of graph algorithms. One is to create this overlap layouts into a graph and look for a Hamiltonian path in the graph. Another idea is to sort of dualize it. The nodes are, so you take every k-mers, words of length k, 
and structure it so that uh, you have two KMRs combined by edges that are the prefix and suffix, common prefix and suffix of K minus one set. And you look for an Eulerian path, which seems like an easier problem, but then the, if you have a loop, then you don't have a unique solution. And also, if there are errors, it is also an entry complete problem. So the main problem here has been that somewhere there's an entry complete problem lurking. And um, the greedy algorithm, if, the, if your genome was completely random, the greedy algorithm will do quite well. And so would this, because the graph that could be generated by this would be a quartal graph. So um, that would have a linear time algorithm for finding Hamiltonian path. And also this problem, the problem is that DNA is not completely random. So it's not random sequence as the base um, OK, so these are the sets of algorithms that people have developed. And I have categorized them in terms of overlap layout, greedy, and sequencing by hybridization. And there are some other greedy style algorithms by seeding and extending. One of the interesting things to notice is that almost all overlap layout consensus algorithms, which was used by Celera, stops around 2008. And all the sequencing by hybridization algorithms start around 2008. So what happened then is that we went from Sanger sequencing to next generation viral sequencing or other approaches. And the read length got shorter and we got higher overlap. And that required us to change the set of underlying algorithms. So it's sort of like, you know, if I change the architecture of a computer, you have to throw out all the operating systems, all your languages, and all your compilers and these things. So why is it that we don't have algorithms that are technologically agnostic? Given that these are all approximate algorithms, but why didn't we have a common set of ideas? So, so one of the things, the basic idea is that we are going to take two reads, A and B, and look for overlaps. So one of the things to worry about is that sometimes I'll read from pi prime to C prime. Sometimes I'll read from C prime to pi prime. Sometimes I'm reading your Watson strand. Sometimes I'm reading your Greek strand, and I have to be careful in doing the overlap correctly. So this could be normal or any, but given a set of overlaps, I can always tell if it is a feasible set. That means it's an admissible layout, it satisfies certain properties, and that's easy to check. But not all admissible layouts will generate a correct assembly. So we need to put some constraint, and one of the constraints is to optimize the cumulative overlap, which translates roughly to finding the shortest common superstring. So given lots of strings, I want you to find the shortest superstring from which all the strings could have been derived with the error processes. Right. And that problem is NP complete. Right, this is not a correct formulation because if I have repeats, it says I can always do better by compressing the repeats, overlapping all the repeats in one place. Repeats exist, so we have a problem that the formulation is not correct. But but we worried that this is NP complete. So we need we have two problems. One is to solve the complexity issues, and also structurally it should be correct. So we want to find the repeats correctly, because otherwise all the rearrangements, all the inversions, translocations will be good. Right, it is important. Right. So some of the problems we have is because of the repeats. There's also another issue, that if I have a haplotypic ambiguity, that means your father and mother are more or less similar, and there's a region where they defer, I may not be able to tell that these are a haplotype ambiguity or a repeat. Okay. So sometimes the haplotypic differences get encoded as repeats. So I have to be careful with both. Okay. Right now, these algorithms are not uh, modeling that correctly. But let's stick, stay with NP completeness. So um, the basic idea is that for the computer scientists, um, I shouldn't be going through this. So if I think of each sequence reads as towns and overlaps as roads, then uh, the shortest common superstring problem is similar to visiting all the towns 
using the roads in a minimum distance too. So it's sort of like a traveling salesman's problem, which can be reduced to SAT and to Latin square and to pseudo cookies, n by n pseudo cookies. So if I can, even in the simplest formulation, if I can solve this problem, I can definitely do pseudo cookies, n by n pseudo cookies. Um, why is Sudoku interesting? Oh, it is easy to verify if a solution of a Sudoku problem is correct. I give you a correct solution, you can check. If you exhaustively try all possible configurations, you can find the correct solution, but this will take very long time. Uh, nobody has a rigorous argument to convince us that there might not, might not be a better efficient way to solve Sudoku. So we don't know if P is equal to NP. It's possible I have a cousin in Florida who can solve this very complex Sudoku in um, constant time. We can't prove that he's wrong, uh, I'm wrong. Not all instances are hard. If I'm flying to Georgia, I can choose a easy Sudoku. If I'm flying to India, I can choose a definitionally hard. And I, right. So not all of them are equally difficult. But if you try to create a Sudoku puzzle at random with high probability, it'll be easy to solve. Um, so what do we learn from this? Well, <laughs> so how to cope with NP completeness? Tell the biologist to think about it. <laughs> Come up with a simpler problem that vaguely looks like the original, which is what shortest common superstring does. And solve the easy problem, even if it gives the wrong answer. Tell the biologist to learn to live with the incomplete or incorrect. Um, work with the biologist to cheat. I like this one. Design experiments and technologies so that they only generate easy instances of a hard problem and solve them correctly. Um, in fact, uh, using this optical map, you can sequence an E. coli in about four hours. And you can prove that it's NP complete and should take an enormous amount of time. So the idea is that under certain parameters, these are simple. Solve the problem by exhaustive search, but learn to constrain the search space intelligently. These two go together. Try all of the above. Um, here is my example of traveling salesman's tour. Uh, this is a traveling salesman tour of all the towns in the world. Um, this was done using branch and cut. Uh, these are examples from SAT solvers. Uh, um, this is mini SAT. This is 600 lines of code. Um, and one can solve millions of variables. This classical DPLL algorithms. Um, so if we can do that, we should be able to do genomes. So the idea is to find NP easy problems. So this is not a term I, I coined. It's from Moshe Vardy. So um, to generate easy instances of hard problems. So one of the things that one can do is to add other constraints. So that gets around the problem that just optimizing overlap constraint is not the optimal one, is not the correct one. So one of the ways I can get around that is to put met pair constraints. That means if I have two reads and I have distances between them, my solution should agree with that. So if I have repeats and I have a mate pair for some read from the repeat that's outside of the repeat, then I should be able to distinguish between these two. Another thing you can do is to constrain that so that the local coverage follows some sort of Poisson process. So if you have compressed repeats, it'll have a larger local overlap. So that constraint should get around that. But the one I like the most is the kinds of constraints that come from very long range, low resolution information. So I want to get 300 KB, 400 KB megabits long single molecule from you and get very low resolution physical markers on that. So if I assemble something, I can check, validate that it is correct. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, precisely meaning about, right. It, right, so you'll see those physical markers in the repeats. So if you had repeats that are megabase long, then optical maps won't be satisfactory. But it looks like there's only one megabase long repeat in the humans. So uh, we know that. Um, but, but you could overcome that if you had two, three megabase long. Model. That's a little hard because of the sample preparation problem. Okay. So the idea is to just uh, go back to doing an exhaustive search. 
you start with the start node, look at overlaps, and look at all possible ways you can combine the overlap, expand into a tree to the right, do the same thing to the left, and take all the score functions that I talked about and the penalty functions and find the optimal path left to the right. The one problem with this is that my branching factor is very high, and I'll need a lot of memory and a lot of time. And in fact, as I increase the coverage, my branching factor will increase because the more pieces will overlap. Okay. So it's a nice idea, but it looks like it'll run into difficulties. But other than that, I, if I can prune, I'm going to do fairly well. So instead of looking for a good solution quickly, as Greedy does, my job is to find bad solutions quickly and eliminate them and find a lot of them very quickly. So the first thing that happens is that if A overlap with B, B overlap with C, I'd like to see A overlap with C. Simple transition. If I'm doing something incorrectly, the thing repeats, and so on and so forth, I'll see this kind of violation very quickly and eliminate it. Okay. Something like 90% of the branches will get eliminated by this. The next thing is to look at large number of branches. If I'm going along the correct solution with A, I'll have reads B1 through Bn that will overlap, but also I'll have this transitive overlap. B1 will overlap B2, B2 will overlap B3, and so on. So if I can quickly detect this, I can collapse these branches into a single branch. So most of the time, I'm in some intergenic region, and I will see this collapse all the time except when I hit haplotypic ambiguities or repeats. If I do that, then these two, these will group into two groups because I'll find subsets that will not overlap with each other. Okay. And when I do that, when I see that, I simply look at it. I go forward on both directions. And now I have long distance constraints. I simply score both branches. If I have only one branch that succeeds, right, then I know that this one is not correct and it is a repeat. If I have both of them um, satisfying these external long range constraints, what do I know? I have an haplotype. That means your father's chromosome has gone that way and your mother's chromosome has gone. So the same thing solves both haplotypic ambiguities and repeats. And there are lots and lots of technologies that can give me long range information. And I don't need very high accuracy. All I need is a little bit of information and some approach, some very fast algorithm, which can be done using hashing, geometric hashing, to say which one is likely to occur. So speed, you, you can get the speed because most of the times you're going with a single branch. So it is actually doing the greedy algorithm. In fact, this algorithm often beats the greedy algorithms. And most of the repeats don't go very far. There are about 200, 300 bases. So these trees are not very deep. So it does go, blow up into exponential growth occasionally, but they're very rare, and they don't go for too long. So that's about it. So we did some comparison, and this algorithm does better than the competitors. Uh, I don't want to go too much into this. The question still remains, how do you know that what you have assembled is correct? So suppose I just give you a 3 billion ATCG and see, say that that's your genome. How do you know that I'm incorrect? Right? That's pretty much what we did about 10 years ago. Um, one idea has been to uh, create in silico simulation and run these algorithms and see how well they match. But how do you know that your in silico simulation is actually matching the correct genomic structure? So one of the ideas that we have been exploring is to find various features in the assembly, in the layouts, and try to use learning algorithms to say which features are likely to give us better answer. And um, by doing PCA and ICA analysis, we found that there are a very small number of features that are sufficiently good in predicting. So, um, so we analyzed uh, several assembly algorithms and um, essentially did something like receiver operator curves, ROC curves, to compare this. 
So um, here is some advice to young genomicists, Moore versus J1s. Sequencing data are growing too fast, but without leading to real benefits. Data compression, better base and algorithms, parallelization and scaling are what genomics needs. Bigger clouds is not a substitute for thinking. So we can't solve all the problems by just having clouds. We need to trust but verify. Genomics is a wicked problem. What that means is that if I define the problem and solve it, my solution tells me that I have not correctly formulated the problem originally. So what I, I fail, but I learn how to reformulate the problem correctly. Okay. Um, so we need to keep going at it until uh, we have a correct formulation. Um, massive data is not going to solve our problems. When we base call, the world calls with us, but when we GWAS, we GWAS alone. Um, base calling, doing the low-level sequence reads is not the hardest problem. The hard problem is, uh, and I think we should be optimistic. None of this is going to stop us. And um, I want to uh, dedicate this to my mentor, Bill Wolf, uh, who taught me a lot of interesting things in computer science. I'm handy when I face real problems. And that's the end. Question? I'm sorry I took too long. Assumption is that the base uh, genome gets better as you test more people, right? That would be the, because then your your base of comparison, your sample gets better and better. Um, if we sequence more people, yeah. Not necessarily. We will understand more polymorphisms, more variants. But what we are assuming that if I am able to haplotypically sequence then I will understand the population structures better. So one of the problems is that um, what we have done is done genotypic sequencing. And from that, we have tried to do population stratification, understand the genetic relationship between people, and use the genotypic data from the population to impute haplotype phasing. What I'm suggesting is other way around. We do haplotype correctly using the technology and use that to impute family structure, understand who is related to them. And the reason I'm arguing for that is that when we did linkage analysis, when we looked at families and did genetic analysis on families, we've done well. So it's not that there's a fundamental problem that we can't overcome. And also we know that if I look at trios and quadros and have the genome sequences correctly, I can always do better. So would like to drive to a sampling and understanding the population-wide genome structures much better than we do now. And I'm arguing the genotypic assembly is not giving us that information. Because I'm losing the information between how you are related to your father and mother and grandfathers. And yes? Um, this, as you're speaking, it, it reminded me of the um, the Folded program for um, protein. Right. Uh, I was wondering if you thought of uh, is it similar in nature to that problem, and if you thought of approaches like that that take a more spatial based um, or, or like employing a, you know, crowdsourcing, I suppose. Some people have suggested that, but I think um, there's actually some fundamental questions that we can do algorithmically. So the we base need to for think it. about the technology and algorithms better before we hand it over to people. But uh, the difference between the two problems is, uh, is it the, um, the protein problem is like not solvable by the current technology, and you think this one is? Uh, I'm not uh, an expert in proteomics, so um, it's not, I mean, 
most of the protein problems are relatively smaller than this. Um, but proteomics has done very well because we have put various evolutionary constraints. So there, the problem is that um, if I write down the so optimization problem for protein folding, is also NP-complete. But there, I'm going to argue that it's possible that nature has only selected easy problems already. Because if a protein did not fold rapidly, it has a selection disadvantage. So maybe all the proteins we have are actually easy problems to solve, but the way we are trying to solve it is not formulating it right. So one of the ways to think about that, if I do homologies, if I take pieces of proteins and find homologous proteins or domains and steal their structures, but right, use the known structures for those, then I can do better. Right? Because there is an evolutionary constraint that's helping me. So I think protein folding is a fundamentally different kinds of problems. There, the easiness is already there. Huh. Here, I need to do something in technology so that these pieces uh, sort of fit together. There are enough constraints so that it can be turned into an easy problem. Right. I mean, in some sense, this, I mean, I find it uh, very difficult to think about biology and, and the completeness. Because there's already, already witnesses for it in the in, in, in the nature, so somehow we're not using that witness to just verify. So, so somehow, if we collected the right kind of information, the problem should be simpler. Um. Uh, I was wondering when when you have those uh, two sequences and you're calculating the overlap. Uh, can two sequences have more than one overlap? In other words, like this and then like this? Uh, yeah. Because of repeats? Yeah. And yeah. then you would always choose the bigger overlap? But currently, that's what people do. What is the state of research in area of physical sequencing? Uh, like you're the person who are close to science? Um, there is a lot of interest. I don't know if... Uh, People saw in the newspaper about a month ago, there was a company called Oxford Nanopore, which announced that they can read DNA about 48 kilobases, 100 kilobases, by just pushing the DNA through a small hole. Right. So that's the... What is the quality of their read? What are the they error have, rate? They claim they have about 4% error. Is better than uh, uh, shotgun sequencing? No, it's slightly worse. Um, but, but you know, there hasn't been enough to know that uh, it is actually an available technology. And another question is about proteins. Uh, if we can work from evolution in proteins, we can work backward in genomics too, uh, because uh, genome uh, was not mutated randomly too. It was properly reassembled with, uh, from pieces of our genomes and RNA and other species, and uh, we can limit our searches and the Right. You know, the historic data, which you can right. compare. But we don't have enough historic types. data. So if okay. we get 10,000 humans, I think I have enough historic data. Right. So, right. So there is a lot of similarities, and I can write on that. And that, that's why the first part of the talk emphasized that. Because after that, genome assembly is not a problem. If I have enough. But you don't need to use only humans. You can use uh, a lot of different species. And if you go deeper in evolution, you can compare what types of uh, uh, mutation you saw. And if you see a pattern in mutation, you can limit your searches uh, only based on those mutations. Um, it's possible. The g g genome evolution is somewhat um, different uh, because there are intergenic regions and introns that are under neutral. Uh, selection, so they can mute it. Uh, and also we know that there are a lot of uh, copy number changes. Most of evolution actually runs by duplication, so uh, which actually encourages repeats. So classical example was P73, P53, P63 that we talked about, hemoglobin, myoglobin. There's lots of examples of that. And that can confuse us, actually. So, 
slightly different from proteins, but but the idea is a good idea. Thank you for your talk. Um, maybe you can help me with a little bit of simple math. So. We have four values for each uh, base pair, and, and I think you said there were three billion base pairs per per sequence, and so that's what like six six gigabytes per per read. If it's two bits per pair, whatever if my math's right, six gig six gigabytes per sequence. That, so that's basically what you need to store for posterity and future analysis and things like Actually that. Actually, much less. What do, you, what do you what do you think? What is the number? What does it come to per sequence on on disk? I, I don't need to store the entire sequence. I can just store the difference you have from the Inst. nearest uh, right, Craig Venter, Jim Watson, whoever you choose. As, as long as I know that I've got the correct sequence, even if I don't, and the storage that would suffice. So it's not the storage that's problematic. But the, currently, the way we collect the data, that's problematic. You meant a fair amount of your talk was about um, bringing the reference library to the sequencer and doing analysis at the sequencer instead of transferring the sequence. But that would have to be fairly flexible and robust because as we go forward, we want to do new analysis against maybe right. a different reference. So right. the more you put in, 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 in hardware and move to the machine, the easier it is to get out of step with the latest technologies. In the latest right but I can I can always uh, th th this is a lossless compression I can always restore I can always re re recreate the data in the cloud because I have the reference and I know the changes know the difference so I'm not losing anything I'm not transmitting or storing the entire information thank you Just to follow up, but on the last question, hope Bob gives up. Let me introduce myself. The obviously the FPGA can be rela reloaded at will. Yes. So at that point, it doesn't matter what changes happen in the cloud right. that improve your data. You just do a reload, feel the reload of the firmware. The other thing I can also relate to, even if I'm talking about ten thousand references, even hundred thousand references, it's not actually a huge amount of data because the genome is roughly divided into pieces, 30 kilobase, kilobases pieces, roughly on the average. And each of those only come in very small number of variants, seven or eight. So it's the underlying pieces with some small mutations are very few. All I have to do is to organize your, your DNA with respect to those building blocks. So 100,000 people is not really that much data. It's more than it's yeah. The order of a large laptop drive. Right. It is that. Thank you very much. Thank you.